Hi, YouTube Live. Hi, uh, attendees on Zoom. Uh, we're just going to wait probably here about um, 60 more seconds until everybody gets in. Uh, and uh, make sure that you're using the Q&A box on Zoom. And if you're on YouTube Live, uh, I'll be monitoring the live chat for uh, Coach Joel Johnson. So we'll start shortly. Coach Joel, are you ready? I am. Hi, everybody on YouTube Live and, and Zoom. We just wanted to welcome you back to USA Hockey webinar series presented by BioSteel and Pure Hockey. We're really excited to have uh, Coach Joel Johnson from the University of Minnesota on. Uh, he's a six-time national champion coach, which is pretty impressive, I have to say. Um, I don't know if that's a record or something, but that's probably pretty high up there. So that's pretty impressive. But he also coaches our U.S. national teams in many different ages. But, you know, with, with Coach Joel Johnson, he has a master's in organizational, organizational leadership. And this is something that he's going to discuss probably a little bit today, um, building these teams on a short um, time frame. And, you know, some of the quotes that I'm getting from his colleagues are pretty impressive. Uh, you know, he's, he's able to create family out of team players in such a short period. Um, another one would be is a very passionate and caring coach. Uh, he connects with players and fosters great relationships. All stuff that we've been talking about the last few few weeks uh, here on the on the webinar. Um, but I just want to kind of start off and ask you, Joel. Uh, you know, you you played uh, college hockey and college soccer and college baseball at Bethel. How was your time there? Well, that was back in the day when you could when you could probably do a little bit more. Um, you know, the demands of of time weren't as high, at, especially at the Division three level, and and so it was it was by far the the best thing. Uh, right about the time I was getting tired of one sport, the, you know, the next one was ramping up, and uh, so I really enjoyed it. it. Meant uh, you know twice as many or three times as many uh, great roommates and teammates and relationships, and and so it was uh, it was a joy. I uh, I always had fun. Got a little dinged up uh, probably from it all, but uh, but loved every second. What was your favorite sport? You know, I would always say the next one. Uh, you know, you, I think every season you get a little fatigued and uh, depending on uh, the success your team is having or maybe isn't uh, isn't achieving, uh, it gives you something to look forward to. Uh, I certainly uh, have found a career in hockey. I uh, probably was uh, my least uh, capable sport as an athlete. I was probably better at soccer and, and baseball, but uh, but that's all right. I love the game. That's cool. And then you started coaching pretty much right after you graduated um, at Bethel, how did that all take place? And did you know that you're going to be a coach prior to the, prior to graduating? Yeah, that's what I wanted to do when I enrolled. Uh, you know, a lot of people are undecided and I was, I was sure that I wanted to be a teacher and a coach right, right away and had some good mentors growing up and also had some great mentors while I was, um, competing as a, as a college athlete. So it just renewed and, uh, uh rekindled my passion for, for wanting to do that. I jumped in right away, volunteering where I could at the high school level um girls hockey in minnesota at that time was just starting so i was a volunteer assistant for a junior varsity team uh combined school district team and and then that uh, led just gradually relationships formed and uh, one thing led to another and got got uh, opportunities at the collegiate level and in a variety of sports and ended up at the university of minnesota now uh two times so uh so it's been a it's been a fun ride yeah so you won two national championships your first time in your first stint at university of minnesota and I read that there was one time that uh, the your team only let up th 34 goals the entire season. Like, that's just unheard of. Like, that would be, I mean, how crazy is that? How did that all come about? And, you know, you know, your focus a lot is defense. Is there anything particular that you're doing that you're just, you know, having four goalies in the net or something? Yeah, no, I think, I think uh, this is a, a canned answer, but it all comes down to, you know, who's going out the door. Um, you know, we certainly do our best as coaching staff collectively we always have of trying to trying to make sure our players are prepared but um you know when we put uh certain combinations out there that that were just really gifted players uh they certainly deserve the credit and uh and we were excited to be able to help develop them as they as they played yeah and and then you after winning two national championships you moved back over to bethel your alma mater you know to coach boys hockey or men's hockey 
how has that changed for you? And what was that like going from girls to boys? Yeah, you know, I, I get that question a lot, you know, coaching different sports and, and men and women. And I think the there are differences because people are different. Um, but at the college level, athletes want to be treated like athletes. And so I think you recognize personality differences on your teams uh, if they're if they're you know 25 guys in the room or 25 uh, gals in the room, you're still going to have different uh, relationships and different personalities. And so you just have to identify those and find out uh, how to motivate them, how to teach them. Um, so yeah, there, there are differences, uh, but I, I think I think they sometimes get overblown. The game is still the same. A few d tiny rules uh, that are a little bit different, but athletes want to be athletes and they want to compete. And uh, there, there's uh, no different uh, male or female or sport to sport when it comes to that. That's really cool. And then you headed back to uh, University of Minnesota for the last nine nine years and won even more titles. Uh, you know and. <laughs> During that time in 2017, you won assistant coach of the year for women's hockey. That was probably a pretty, that's a pretty special honor. And, you know, it says a lot about you because there's so many good coaches out there. Um, any anything that you've learned over those two times with Minnesota from the first time to the second time and, you know, just thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, I, one of the, one of the driving factors for taking some time back at Bethel was, uh, was my, my family was, uh, my kids were young. Now they're uh, old graduating high school. And, and um, so it was a really great opportunity for me. You know, the demands at the division one coaching level are, are significant as far as time and travel. And, and so it was a great opportunity for me to step away from some of those expectations and be at a, at a little bit different atmosphere at Bethel with people I, I really loved and learned a lot from. And so then uh, when, when things worked out and there was an option to, to go back to the university, um, you know, Brad Frost is a great friend of mine and, and, uh, he had offered, uh, or tried to talk to me a couple of years in a row about it. And I just wasn't the right time. And then finally it became the right time. And it's been, uh, it's been a fun ride working with, uh, with so many other gifted coaches at the university of Minnesota. Yeah, that's, that, that's awesome. Then you kind of got your, your start within USA hockey and the international experiences in 2013 as an assistant coach for the U S U 18, um, select team and then moved on to being the head coach for four years and you won four gold medals in a row um, in the IIHF U18 World Championships. How was that time coaching, you know, against the team up north is what we call it, you know? Yeah, it, you know, we were really fortunate to win four times in a row. Both, both uh, you know, the U.S. and Canada have, tr have such strong programs and it usually comes down to a, to a, a goal, one goal game. And we certainly saw that a few times in some overtime uh, matchups as well. Uh, again, I, I think when I look back on it, the thing that I remember the most are the relationships with the players and the relationships with the other uh, coaching staff and, and, uh, and non-coaching staff members. That, that's what made it great. Uh, we found great chemistry and synergy um, using gifts that, uh, that we all brought to the table. And, and so uh, certainly uh, sometimes the, the, the recognition goes to a certain player or a certain title of a coach and nothing can be further from the truth. It was so fun four different teams, unique teams, um, and, and great coaching staffs and, and great uh, other staff members that, uh, that made it uh, unforgettable. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you, you, there's a couple of other quotes that I got from some of your colleagues about, you know, you, you, you have a knack, knack of getting the best out of each individual player and staff members. And I, I really like kind of the point that you're kind of bringing in the staff members because, you know, there's so many people it comes from, um, you know, it could be hockey operations or somebody helping, you know, the strength and conditioning and it's the whole team approach is, is bringing it all together. So I really like how you're using that. Um, and then you moved on to the, uh, in 2018 and 2019 as the U S U 22 select team coach, what is the U S um, U 22 select team? If uh, for our viewers that don't know. Yeah, the U22 is just a, it's a very short window of uh, three games against Canada at the end of August. And so um, there's a group of players that are brought into our national team festival, which includes um, under 18 players uh, and over 18 players and national team players. And then for those that fit into the age category of the U22, um, it's just a chance to select a group of 20 or 22 players and, and play Canada for, for three games in, in the same way that the U18 team does uh, just a little bit of a series to get some competition and some more evaluation. So there's no world championships. There's nothing after that one August event. Um, but it's, it's always a fun time when you can actually, you know, put, put the actual sweater on and, and go compete. And, and then you've, you've been working with the U S national um, 
senior adult girls team. And I think I butchered that, but uh, you know, our, our national team, our women's national team. And uh, this is your first year working with them. How is that working with them and uh, working with the great coaches that they have? Yeah, it's been great. Um, obviously, there's a lot of the players that are on the national team that I've had uh, the privilege to coach before and or coach against when they were collegiate players. Uh, so the, there's a lot of familiarity um, that I have with with the roster. And so it's been it's been really fun to uh, to kind of connect back with a few of them and and um, and, and have the, you know, the privilege to coach them and also with the staff. Uh, whether they're, they're coaching staff members or non-coaching staff members, it, it's been uh, a huge opportunity for me to learn and grow as a coach. I've, I've just taken so many opportunities to, to learn different best practices from, um, from the, the variety of coaches that are, have been around our, our camps and festivals. Uh, and, and that includes our, our summer development camps and our, you know, whether it's a 15 new development camp or a senior national team development camp, just being able to hang around great coaches from across the country and, and hear different tactics and strategies has been something that has really helped me grow as a coach. That's awesome. So now I want to kind of shift in, you know, you have a master's in organ organizational leadership. Can you kind of define what that is? And then, um, you know, how does that in, how does that help you with these U S national teams that you're working with? and building these, you know, family units, as uh, one of your colleagues was saying. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if the, you know, the master's degree, uh, certainly I learned, I learned a lot when I was going through that program. Um, I, I think when it, when you talk about organizational leadership, sometimes I think they were just looking for a catchy phrase to come up with, uh, you know, some degree, um, because I, I think every, each organization and each leadership within a team or a a program or a two week period is, is so different. And so it's, it's unique, but I think that's, you know, having that as a passion of mine has helped me um, try to identify what it takes. Cause you mentioned that the short-term events are, are pretty special. And in some ways they're easier than full college seasons or for full professional seasons, because, you know, there's not enough time to get super mad at each other um, and disappointed, but, uh, but it does take some special, uh, you know, kind of some, you know, trying to maximize each moment and capture momentum at the key time, whether that's uh, in your own locker room or on the ice. And, and, uh, and I think that's when, that's when we've been at our best is when we've been able to do that. That's cool. So do you want to start sharing your screen and, and get to your, your program? Sure. I think. So uh, for, for those watching on YouTube live and also uh, zoom, make sure you send in any questions on the Q and a part. That would be easier for us to answer. And then if you're on YouTube live, there's a live chat that I can monitor and kind of ask some questions for, for coach Johnson. And, um, we can go from there. All right. I'm not, uh, I'm not being able to, uh, to share this. Did you need to, to take something off for me to, to share it or let's try it again. You should be able to go try that again. All right. I, uh, I'm just struggling to find the, uh, the cursor here. <laughs> How's that look? Uh, not yet. I put you as co-host to try that. There we go. But now we're back to kind of the, All right. yep. One more time here. <laughs> it did work before. Yeah, no, it, uh, I know we're on record, but. We just got a penalty in the game and now we're trying to overcome the penalty. Yeah. We're five on three. Uh, can you, uh, there we go. Let's try this one more time. Your, that's that your desktop. Work? Yeah, it's your desktop though. All right. All right, hit the share screen again one more there. You, you got to hit it. There we go. And now I will. That's the wrong one. Yeah. I'm normally the tech guru on our staff. So this is kind of <laughs> embarrassing, but. Uh... So I, I have some questions for, for everybody that's in, in the audience. Um, I was wondering for you, how many times have you actually watched one of these webinars? And if you put in the chat or the Q and A, we just want to see how many, uh, how often the people are, are, are coming on the webinar. So we can see it now, coach. So you're Great. ready to go. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start off 
just uh, saying that the title presentation was coaching with ulterior motives and uh, it's kind of a weird title and I, I want to explain it. Uh, it. It's kind of the philosophy that, that I've had uh, as a coach um, for a long time. And, uh, you know, ulterior motive, I put the definition up there is, you know, some uh, concealed or, or, or different reason that you have um, for doing something. And I think when we're at our best, a win-win has ulterior motive. It looks for and identifies a dual purpose. And so the other thing is everybody talks about culture and why is it so important? And it's a kind of a buzzword, emotional intelligence, culture, all these things. And, uh, and it kind of gets tiresome to, to be honest, but I think a, you know, when I say the culture is important, it's, it's, it's always a mistake to decide what you're going to do before you determine who or what you want to be. And, uh, that's the reason that, that I get excited about kind of the organizational leadership. It's, uh, it's why I think culture is so important and it's why, Certainly, you have to have a, a baseline of talent, but um, when you have a team with a great culture and then you in, include the talent, it makes a makes a pretty big deal. And um, people who know me know that my favorite pictures are are uh, by far whenever we start a season or, or, or start a tournament or an event. You know, you want to you want to see that the picture of, of gloves on the ice, and you don't even know whose is where, and and uh, and it's just a, it's a it's a, such a perfect picture and. This is one of our, our world championships that, that we have. And, and the win-win culture that I, that I think is important um, is a pursuit of success and significance. And you know, success is, is fairly easy to define uh, because it's the scoreboard at the end of the day, it's the gold medal or the silver or the bronze or none. Um, but significance has to do with the people that you impact and the people that impact you. And I think a win-win is, uh, is just that. It's having success, but it's also knowing that the second win, the dual purpose of it is to have significance. And I think athletes and coaches with authentic confidence uh, usually have success, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're significant. You know, and then there's people that, um, that, that have authentic humility. And those are the people that have impacted me the most. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're always successful. Uh, I've been on teams that have had high degree of success, but uh, lack relationships. And I've been on teams that have great significance uh, but we've, uh, we haven't won. And uh, those are frustrating times, but I'll tell you what, the best is when you can get a combination um, of both, because when you find both attributes in a person or a team, you find greatness. And I can think of teammates that I've had who are unbelievably confident and successful, and then also authentically humble uh, and significant. And so I think the best coaches and the best leaders as we develop them um, have that win-win mentality of both success and significance. So I just want to, in, in my presentation here, I'd want to give you four ideas to think about um, that I, I believe kind of win-win cultures have. The first is a proper definition of success. The second is players with a baseline uh, talent and ability. The third is uh, leaders and coaches that are trusted enough uh, to deal with difficult situations and distractions. And the fourth is also leadership piece of coaches and players who are devoted to each other and the people the process and the, and the performance. So to kick it off the proper de definition of success for, for the way that, uh, that, that I've had fun coaching teams is the fulfillment and embodiment of our predetermined values, regardless of the external results. And that's, again, that's the win-win. It's saying we can't just be successful external results. Um, we know that we're going to be measured by, you know, the, uh, the, the color of the medal for USA hockey that we win, but we want to actually define success in addition to that. And so um, they, you know, great teams that, that I've had the privilege to coach crave to win. They want the idea that they're going to be measured on wins and losses. They, they love the competition and they, they get excited about beating somebody else in particular, you know, the U S Canada series. Um, but they also know that they're going to define themselves on, on the values that we together as a, as a, as a coaching staff and as a, as a team staff and as a player group, we've already decided, hey, here's what it looks like for us to be successful um, according to our values. And so that win-win is, is having that success on the ice and off the ice. Because as I mentioned here, you can win the wrong way and lose the right way. Um, and when you win the right way with a great group, uh, it really has unparalleled satisfaction. The other thing for personal success is I say, all right, I'm gonna apply the same thing as a coach, as an athlete. The fulfillment and embodiment of my predetermined values, regardless of the external results. And I, I want to talk to youth coaches who are out there 
um, because I had the privilege to coach my daughter's teams a few, a few years growing up as she was in youth hockey. And I'll tell you what, the more that we can advocate um, to help our athletes understand what personal success and team success is, the better off we are. And uh, it, was, it was challenging uh, when I was coaching, I, I believe it was U14 or U15 season, um, trying to get, uh, you know, teenage middle school girls to, uh, to figure this out. And I'll tell you what, it was some of the most rewarding coaching that I've ever had. Just as rewarding as USA Hockey, national championships, anything, was, uh, was seeing sometimes the success on the ice not be great but having them understand and, and be defined by the values that they choose. So that's what I, that's what I think the first part is, is uh, to have that personal core belief system as an individual or as a team uh, that, that you define your success on. So the second one, as I mentioned, was uh, players with a baseline of talent and ability. And uh, this is just the reality. This is the slap in the face that says, if you're going to play a game and you, and you don't have the talent that another team does, it's going to be hard to win. You can still have a significant experience, um, but it's going to be a challenge. And so I always show this sometimes to parents uh, that, and I'll say, Hey, you're maybe your puck skills as player one there, your puck skills are awesome. Uh, and your hockey IQ is a little bit less and your skating is this. And that baseline is, is a reality. It's a, it's a conversation piece when, when, uh, when you have to have a tough, uh, tough conversation with a player about why they're not in the lineup or why they are not playing as much as somebody else when you get to the higher competitive levels. Um, and it, it's also a great uh, analysis for, for youth players just to say, hey, this is what you're already naturally gifted at. And here's some of the things that the, you aren't as gifted in, as in other areas. And so you certainly have to recognize that a win-win culture has to have players who can actually skate. Uh, who can make passes, who can shoot the puck, who can make a save. And, and so to, to pretend that you can just get together and have a, have a great time um, is, is not why we play the game. It's one of the reasons we play the game, but we also play because at some point, the higher level you get, you want to keep score. So when you think about baseline talent ability, it's just what I was describing. How, how talented are the players? Obviously, the older, older the, the, the teams get, um, the national team levels, the collegiate levels, the professional levels, um, man, it's, it, it's really tough. And uh, the subjective attributes, the thing that I put there at the bottom, they can oftentimes be the deciding factor at the highest levels. And I think that's a really important piece for, for athletes to understand. Um, you know, at the collegiate level, we talk about, you know, your grades count just as much in ninth and 10th grade as they do in 11th and 12th. And these, these subjective attributes are, are remind me of that, of that same thing in the sense of, you know, when, when all of a sudden everybody's fast and everybody's strong and everybody can shoot the puck and, and you're, you're the thing that's separated, the separating factor that you used to have doesn't exactly exist to the same separating level anymore. All of a sudden your attitude and your work ethic and your off-ice character and all those things really become part of that ability. And, and that's why, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Dave. Hey, no, that's okay. I just want to kind of touch on uh, what we, uh, a couple of the other presenters were talking about. What would be two qualities that you would say would be the number the two top things that you see in a athlete at, for these subjective attributes, you know, work ethic, attitude, but what would maybe kind of pinpoint that? Yeah, I think, I think the, um, the obvious ones that we always talk about are attitude and effort. Um, but I think there's, you have to unpack the attitude um, a little bit more. Uh, effort is obvious. Um, do you work as hard as you can uh, at a consistent level? And I think that is that is one of the, the separating factors because even even if you're not as skilled as someone, if you put in the extra time, that's always noticeable. I think when it comes to attitude, um, it's really based on on your level uh, and how people should be you know treated and in, in 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 terms of how they grow up. And I think that the new buzzword for that would be emotional intelligent. Um, how do you relate to your teammates? How do you relate to your coaches? How do you receive feedback? Um, those are all components of your attitude. Uh, how do you treat everybody around you? Um, when you show up at the rink every day, what, what kind of vibe do you give out? Are, do you, are you a joy bringer um, or are you an energy sucker or a vampire, whatever the terms are? And, and so I think that I think you can still say attitude and, and effort, but I think uh, I think there's more to it than that. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I, I also bring up leadership and, and I say the same thing that we just, you know, if you look at leadership that's a gift and a talent especially as players get probably past the u8 level is when you really start to see leadership happen and leadership at the younger levels is just simply how you treat each other 
and leadership at the professional and older levels is the exact same thing. It's how you treat each other. And so you can certainly just look at it and say, here's one of the ways that I've described this to the teams that I've been on is uh, a, a comparison of salt and light. And I brought our teams through this idea of, you know, back before refrigeration, salt was, was also a preservative as, as well as bringing flavor. And, uh, and, it, and it, for those that don't know, back again, before, before there was refrigerators that plugged in and, and if you didn't have uh, a, a bunch of ice um, to, to keep things preserved like meats and things like that, you, you put salt in it. And so uh, one of the things that I'll ask our players is, you know, we need some salt. We need, we need some people to preserve our culture. We need some people to uh, bring a little flavor. And uh, I think the leadership and talent have that impact. And, and the light is the other one, the salt and light. And there's a, this was a story by a, a, a speaker I know named Andy Stanley. And he just said, nobody puts, uh, you know, light and then and covers it up. Nobody, nobody lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. And so he just said, salt always preserved, light always shows the way. And salt works even when you can't see it working and light uh, is working when you don't even think about it. And, and so for me, when I think about leadership, these are two things that that come to mind. Are we preserving our values and our culture and what we want to be about? And is somebody showing us the way? Um, and so I think those are those are uh, two ways to to kind of think about it. So uh, the third area that uh, that I touched on was uh, leaders that are trusted enough uh, to deal with difficult situations and distractions. This is something I've been uh, really kind of exploring this spring during the, this time of of uncertainty. And I just want to pause with that and say I know that there's lots of people in the USA hockey family that are, are very personally affected by this. And uh, as a person uh, who, who uh, enjoys the opportunity to pray and, and express my faith, I, I would just say that uh, my thoughts and prayers are, are with everybody at this, at this really uncertain and difficult times. And um, it, I've been reading a lot about trust and, uh, and this Patrick Lenciani, uh, excuse me, Lenciani quote is, is great. Trust is the foundation of real teamwork. And so the first dysfunction of a team um, which is this is the book five dysfunctions of team if, if you if you're looking for something to read it's fantastic um the first dysfunction is is a failure on the part of team members to understand and open up and trust each other and if, i love it if it says if it sounds touchy-feely let me explain because there's nothing soft about it if it's, it's an absolutely critical part in fact it's probably the most important so when the, the third thing that that i think is takes a win-win culture is people that can trust and they always have uh, cultures like that, always have leaders willing to manage difficult situations. I, I love this quote by, by Bill Parcells. It says, a young leader takes on five crises a day and experien an experienced coach pinpoints the one that will affect the team the most. And uh, I've just seen coaches and also uh, players at every level, uh, U8, U10, U12, U15, um, all the way through that, that really good leaders have the ability to, to understand that. And then a, a Brian Lawton quote that we've shared with our team quite often, uh, culture doesn't change when a coach says something, um, real culture change happens when, again, if it's a youth player or a national team player, uh, they stand up and say, Hey, that's not how we do things here. And those are, those are the leaders that you really trust. And, uh, I'll, I'll see if this, uh, video works here. I'm not sure it will, but, uh, if I can try to um, hit play here. You know, uh, I'm a huge Office fan. I hope the audio worked on that. Um, Michael Scott, it didn't? Oh, bummer. Well, we'll, uh, we'll stop that then. Um, but uh, I, uh, let me see if I can. Make one change. Well, anyway, I'll, uh, I'll I'll keep moving on here. The uh, the idea of, of conflict and trust, I think, is. Can you hear me now? All right, perfect. Sorry about that. There. Um, you know, when we talk about trust and, and conflict, again, something that, uh, that you've got great 
leaders, conflict becomes nothing but the pursuit of truth and an attempt to find the best answer possible. And I love that idea with our, with players and coaches on our staff and in the locker room. Um, it, it, it really makes a big difference. Um, I'm not sure. Is my screen still there or not, Dave? And now it went off. Interesting. It's, it's Minnesota. Minnesota's the internet's not working up there. Probably. Yeah, no, there's no question yeah. about that. <laughs> um, can you, uh, can you, can you hit stop share or can you do anything? I'm not even sure. Yep. Give me a second. Okay. You're off and then you go back on. All right. Sorry about this folks. It's uh, like I said, fairly embarrassing, but All right. You're back. All right. Perfect. Glad to be back. Um, so when there's trust, conflict becomes a pursuit of truth and, and conflict without trust and between people leads to politics. And I, I see this happen in locker room all the time when people don't trust each other. So um, just that idea of conflict and trust is super important uh, so that you stop having people politicking around how they want others to react. So uh, again, just going back to the, the third point of being, you know, having a, a real trusted leader when it comes to being or selecting a leader. I think one of the, the real challenges is to ask, who are you going to trust? Um, who do you trust on the team? Who, who do you trust uh, if you're hiring somebody or if you're going to choose to work with somebody for a, a hockey season? Um, because, boy, it's, it's super important as we uh, as we do that. The other thing trusted teammates do. Uh, trusted leaders as they deal with with teammate issues and one of the things that that we've used with our programs at the national team level or uh, or the college level or with my daughter's u14 team was to identify it to deal with it and to be done with it and what's so, so interesting is uh most of us like to identify problems uh, as long as they don't include us um very few of us want to deal with problems and nobody wants to be done with it we always want to gossip and keep talking about it and and great trusted leaders are able to identify it, deal with it, and then be done with it. They walk across the room. They make it weird. They, they confront people. They hold people accountable. They admit mistakes when, they, when they've been struggling with something. They authentically encourage other people. And they're willing to invite others to hold them accountable. So dealing with teammates, trusted leaders do it super well. And uh, another thing that, that I think trusted leaders do is they eliminate distractions. And we shared some ideas with our team about a horse in a race with blinders on. And if you've never done that, I encourage you to, to look it up. Just look up, uh, you know, go to Wikipedia and look up some of the reasons. Um, it was fascinating to find out that even, even horses that train together still want to put blinders on because they're very comfortable in a lot of situations. But uh, because of how far back horses can see, they can essentially see behind them. Uh, I know I'm, I sound like a little bit of a weirdo right now, but it was fascinating to read uh, about their field of view and the vision that they have. And that, that's why those blinders are so important so that they, they can be trusted. The, the, the jockey can actually provide them a clear direction to go. And so the question that I brought to, to myself was what are some of the common distractions for teams? And uh, as we talk, talk about a win-win culture, you know, common distractions. And I, I spent some time this past winter reading a book by Clay, Clay Scroggins and he identifies a couple, I, I think they're fantastic. He says the appearance of success um, is a distraction for, for leaders. The idea of appearing successful has become more important than being successful. And man, do I see myself be tempted in this area um, a lot. You know, what, how, how do I look? How, what's my social media presence? Uh, what, you know, what are the statistics uh, on the coaching record? Uh, you know, all these things. And, and it's, it's become such a, a crave for, for leaders and for teams to actually look better. Not even who cares what the actual success and the significance is in our locker room as long as we look good to the outside. And the allure of progress is another one. We all want to move forward. And sometimes we actually get caught as coaches, I think, just trying to do something. Maybe it's what we've always done, or maybe it's uh, something new that we just keep doing without really trying to say, wait, is this the best thing that we could be doing? So uh, another one is the attraction of certainty. And I think this is, this is very clear. Uh, sometimes the loudest and the most authoritative voice in the room 
uh, that, that says something clear is what everybody wants. Then they can just kind of move on. And I think this is a distraction when we talk about having a win-win culture is to actually find out the right message and to listen to that. I always share the story about, uh, you know, when I was teaching at the high school level and I needed something, I didn't ask any other teacher. I asked the custodian because he knew everything. He also had the keys to everything. And if I needed to know any detail about anything going on, he was the most important person. He was not the loudest and he would sometimes not speak up, but he was the person to ask. And so sometimes we have to say, I'm not going to be attracted to certainty, even though that sounds great. And somebody said, told me to do that. I'm going to actually identify what it is. And so how do we do that? I think uh, his, the, the book that Clay writes, he talks about white noise. And I don't know if anybody out there has a white noise app on their phone. I do with USA Hockey. Uh, you know, a lot of times us coaches will share rooms with other coaches when, when we do development camps. And, and uh, I'm someone that has to have that white noise app when I go to sleep at night because people are coming and going and I'm kind of an early to bed guy. And, and so you get all these opportunities to, to, to have a roommate or whatever. And uh, I would, I turn that white noise app on and, and just a fan or an air conditioner sound and turn it up and I'm able to then finally fall asleep. And the author of this book, Clay, he, he talks about the white noises in our life um, actually being social media and a lot of different things. Um, could be the internet, could be food, could be drink, shopping, relationships, family. And he says, what we do is we turn these things up loud enough and it keeps us from paying attention to what we need to do. And I thought it was fascinating. And I think it's, it's really true for coaches that want to create a win-win culture is we have so much white noise. And so it tempts us to compare and it tempts us to compare to other coaches, to other programs, to other win-loss records. It tempts us to compare to what the association is doing across town and what the, you know, this team that might make it to nationals and all these different pieces. Uh, it, it just tempts us to compare. And the comparison that we do because we're not willing to turn the white noise down because we're paying attention to social media. We're looking across and we're at a tournament and at a venue and everybody, as soon as the, the game is over, all the parents rush to the tournament scoreboard and identify, well, how many goals do we need to make the tiebreaker against such and such? Uh, and, and that's all white noise. And so as a coach, I think it's super important to turn down those things that are white noise so that we can focus on um, the player that's in the corner of the locker room who needs a conversation or the encouragement that needs to take place to another uh, coaching staff member, or maybe the accountability that we need to talk about with our team taking this bad penalty or different things. And so I think we need to turn those white noise things down. And one of the challenges we had for our team this year was specific to social media. What do you need to turn off, unfollow, stop browsing around uh, because it leads to too much comparison. So uh, we talk about what is, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Dave. Yeah, it's funny because yesterday we were talking to Coach Gallivan. He was saying at the NTDP that they would take the phones of all the players as they came into the practice and they would put them in a bag and same thing on the road. Do you do anything like that at the college level? Um, you know, they have like a technology check-in he was talking about. Uh, and we've gone on the story about Austin Matthews turning it off. And, you know, because he is so focused uh, of doing, of being the best, he was able, he knew that he turned off his phone to go to sleep at night. Yeah, we do. We do the same thing. We have a, we have a bag that hangs in our locker room and, uh, and, you know, when players come in for a game, they, you know, they, they drop their phone in the, in the bag and, and, uh, and then we, we leave it off. And, and that's taken some time, you know, five, 10 years ago, it wasn't a big deal. We, I remember one time we had a, a player who used to listen to her iPod or listen to her phone music um, in between periods. And, and she forgot to take her phone. She used to tuck her phone into the side of her, of her hockey pants and, and, uh, or in Minnesota, as we say, breezers. And, um, and so she forgot to take it out and went out and started the second period. And all of a sudden she turns on the ice and, and there's a phone sliding across the middle of the ice and the ref brings it over and says, whose is this? And I thought somebody threw it from the stands um, or something like that. And here it's one of our players who just forgot to take it out of her own equipment. So for that, and also the distraction factor, we, we try to take phones and, and put them in a bag, but. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, Lou Lamarillo, he would actually, there was a rule when the devils were, were playing and when he was with the devils that the, Music was, you didn't have iPods or anything like that, or music players, CD players, but at a certain time during the, before the game, he would say the music has to be off. And so the players can talk, you know, like, and he thought that was a big, big thing too, is turning off that white noise 
whether it's music, whether it's whatever, to make them focus on the game or the tasks on hand. So, uh, and then if you really, uh, our rules, we don't, we're not allowed to have cell phones and stuff in the locker room at the youth level for safe right. sport stuff. So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. We, we do the same thing. We talk about hockey conversations, you know, that's one of the things that I think at, in, at certain points for prior to practice or even certain, uh, certain points, it's not, it's not great to always talk hockey, but then when we get to games, we try to encourage players to, you know, to really be dialed in and, in and, uh, and talk hockey, because as the slide says, what, what we've noticed is when we start to compare and listen to the wrong stuff, it, 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 it kills contentment, steals our joy, diminishes our influence. And I, I was asked once, um, how does it happen? And I tried to break this down for a player. And what I came up with is these, these four things or five things. The first thing you say is this isn't fair. Then you start to feel sorry for yourself. Then you feel entitled, like you are now owed something. Uh, and then you justify thoughts and behaviors that go against your values. You know, you think that's not fair that so-and-so got credit for that goal or that she got more ice time than I did. I start to feel sorry for myself. And now I feel like the world owes me something. And then I think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say this, or I'm going to talk about her behind her back, or I'm going to you know, go off and, and, and do something dumb. And, and this happens in hockey. It happens in life. You can apply this same exact philosophy to uh, to your decisions on a Friday night, um, you know, and we commit actions and, and all of a sudden we're in tough shape. So how do we stop comparing? I, I think, you know, first we recognize when the emotions are tempting to say it isn't fair. And then you identify that white noise. You say, well, what, it, well, where did I get this idea and why am I feeling this way? And, uh, and then you replace it. You know, there's a story about, uh, if anybody has, obviously my tech skills are pretty poor today, but if you've got a decent pair of, uh, noise canceling headphones, um, the cheap ones just kind of block the sound with, with a, you know, extra foam or something like that. But the really nice noise canceling headphones, they actually identify the frequency that the microphone is picking up and then they, they replace it with the opposite frequency. And so whatever noise is coming in to those noise canceling headphones, like the nice Bose ones that you can wear on the plane and stuff, it's got a little microphone that's listening to the to frequency. And then it actually, it, it sends the opposite signal. So I think the same thing happens with, with us when we replace it. If I'm feeling selfish, then choose to think about being grateful. If I'm focused on myself, think about others. How can I be, be you know, that best version of myself? And so uh, to, to conclude this, this, uh, this part, you know, he talks about four habits to turn down noise. And I've just encouraged you, if you've got a pen or paper take a screenshot to, to write these down, find you simplify yourself and ask yourself, why am I, what, what do I, what I love, turn down the noise, get quiet. You know, there's all kinds of surveys out there that, that, uh, that track, you know, great leaders and, and getting quiet's one of them. And then pressing pause, you know, take some time. And especially in these days, uh, that we have, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting time to, to do that. So the other thing that, I think trusted leaders are as disciplined and they do three things. And I want to just walk you through these three things. If I can, um, they study their success. They're prepared. Um, if you don't know why it's working, when it's working, you don't know how to fix it when it breaks. That's what, what my dad always told me. And, and, and they study their success. They regularly journal, uh, and coaches do this as well. They keep track of things. Um, they, they have an unbelievable ethic of disciplined, studying of their success. They know why they're successful when they're successful. And I, I always share this quote at the bottom with our players. If we can't count on you to monitor what you do outside, how can we count on you in big moments? Um, there's a, a quote that I learned in college, proper preparation provides predictable performance. And um, I, I think it, you know, it doesn't guarantee success, but it tells us that we're ready for success. And there's nothing better that I can think to demonstrate this. Uh, the goal, I don't know if you saw the quotes that we're, we're tracking there on the side, but she, she, was, she said she had tried that move a thousand times in practice. And so when we talk about proper preparation, it didn't guarantee that she was going to score that goal in the game. Uh, but it did guarantee that she wasn't nervous. She was excited to try it because she had done it so many times. And the other part of being prepared, I think, as a disciplined teammate is having great habits. And one of the things that I, I try to impl implement in my own life is having a, a keystone habit and understanding that a keystone habit is something that has a trickle down effect. And so a keystone habit for me is exercise. 
and, and a lot of people know this about me. When I exercise, I eat better. When I exercise, I sleep better. When I exercise, my relationships are better. All because I have one key habit that, uh, that has an impact on, uh, on, on the rest. The second thing, they're, they're prepared and they're focused. And I bring this picture up that a lot with our team. I have a decent camera and you can change the focal point. And I just try to explain what's your focal point right now. What are you focused on? Obviously the picture on the left is the whole screen. The picture on the right is just the one flower. And I, I, use, an, I use that images just to, to try to say, what are you saying yes to? What are you saying no to? And a lot of times focus is about saying no. It's about saying, I, I, I don't dislike the rest of that picture, but I'm just gonna focus on the one flower. And, and so when, when we're distracted, we typically are saying yes to too many things. And, and it's all about other people. When we're, when we're focused, we actually scale things down. And, Discipline teammates focus on what they can control. Um, you know, control the controllables, I think, is the most overused uh, mental skill comment by coaches. The question is, do your athletes know how to do this? And, and there's, there's several different ways, but I, the one that I've heard several times is identify what you can control, what, what you can influence, and what you cannot control. And those are three different things. Because the great teammates and leaders and coaches focus on what they can control. They're aware of what they can influence, like a referee. And then they manage what they can, like the other team. And so I think those three things are, are really probably the best way that I've heard in a quick fashion to, to tell your athletes as a coach, how do you focus on what you can control? Because we all here control the controllables. And, uh, and sometimes it's hard to actually tell people how to do that. You know, here's the, the famous picture of Michael Phelps, uh, and whoever, I can't remember the other guy, but uh, the guy that was talking trash before the Olympics and, and disciplined people consistently focus on what they can control, aware of their uh, of the things they can influence and, and manage what they can't. So the other thing Dr. Colleen Hacker, who worked with our national team program shared is, is uh, something called mistake rituals. And, and I kind of challenge whether it's focus or refocus. The ability to refocus is a part of every Every day, every coach has to do it. Every practice, there's going to be distractions that happen there that uh, are weird. And she, uh, Dr. Hacker, just talked about everyone makes mistakes. Don't act like they're rare. Don't be shocked. Sometimes I will make a mistake. I'll I'll screw up, and then I act like, well, that's never happened before. I'll see players do that, and and that's just not the truth. And if if mistakes crush us mentally, our team suffers. We uh, we talked about with our national team program, if, if, um, if a mistake that happens to a, a, a hockey player takes them out of the next two or three shifts mentally, it's no different than them being in the penalty box. And because they're just, they're not, they're not all there. And so we don't want to intentionally put ourselves a player down just because we can't refocus. She brought up a few tactics, flush it, you know, have a visual. Um, she worked with a team once that they had a little mini toilet and they kept it on the bench. And, um, people would grab it and if they made a mistake they would flush it some people use the uh the water bottle to spray their face um some people you know brush it off clear their skates full of ice some people say fooey fix focus you know there's all kinds of these different <clears throat> things that you can do but um it's it's one of the best skills i think we can share with our with our, our usa hockey players is the ability to refocus and Again, back to what, what great discipline teammates focus on. They focus on the specifics. They focus on the 1%. Um, this is clearly, you know, this is a business model. Everybody has probably seen the aggregation of marginal gains, but it's super important to teach players at, at, when they're young, um, what is the one thing that would change everything? What is the one thing we should focus on more than anything else or I, I should focus? What's the one thing that will have that trickle down effect? The one thing that we want to apply a different sense of urgency towards, uh, maybe it's as an individual or as a team, a disproportionate amount of energy towards one thing as a hockey player or as a team, maybe for your team, it's starting fast. Maybe for your team, it's blocking shots. Maybe for your team, it's encouragement. Maybe for your team, it's being ready to start the period or, or, or things like that. But I think as coaches, if we can identify that one thing that's going to make a big difference and have a big trickle down effect, it, uh, it can make a big difference. So I, I heard this uh, other, um, I, I heard this described as a wildly important goal. And a wildly important goal is one that is just what I just described. So one thing, um, just instead of trying to say, we need to do four check, back check, this, this, we, we brought this component with our team this past year. Instead of trying to say too much, we try to have our team focus on one thing. 
And for that, you know, maybe it was for us, it ended up being win the next period. And, and that's all we were focused, focused on. This idea comes from Chris McChesney and Sean Covey. Um, and it just talks about focus on the wildly important. What's the one thing? And then acting on the lead measures. And for those that are unfamiliar with the business term of lead measures, I'll give you an example. If my wildly important goal is to be healthier in 2020, lag measures are, are weight loss. Like that's what's going to happen in hindsight. The lead measures for me would be diet and exercise. And, and, and that's critical. They're going to drive the lag measure. And so if my goal is to be healthier, then I have to act on the diet and exercise. So those actions are specific. And I think this is a really great skill for, for players to learn as uh, for on ice things and also for off ice uh, behaviors. So um, how am I going to do it? I'm going to focus on it. And then I'm going to keep a scoreboard. I'm going to journal about it. And I'm going to create kind of a cadence of, of accountability. Last area that I'll just want to touch on is managing your emotions. And, um, I think this is a pretty good uh, video to, to show it. Uh, I think there might be a, a questionable word in here, so I apologize. This is a compilation of Happy Gilmore and Ernie Els at the two six, 2016 Masters, uh, where he struggled on the, I believe, the first Don't hole. break the wrist and bring that putter back. Whoa, just whoa, like You're confusing me. Just let me put the ball in the hole. For bogey. All right, so it's a par four. That's his fifth. Okay. That's six. <laughs> That's seven. Say, hey, kid. And at this point in time, there's all kinds of weird things going through your brain. <laughs> oh, why didn't you just go home? That's your home. Are you too good for your home? Answer me. It's the first hole of the Masters. And then he misses that. And he makes a six tuple bogey 10. It's about time. It is about time. I mean, I just couldn't get the ball in the hole. I wanted to, but I just couldn't do it. <laughs> so uh, the last part, like I said, managing your emotions. And, um, you know, authentic emotions are transferable, whether we want them to be or not. And so as a coach, when you walk into the room, when you step onto the ice, um, I struggle with this at times and I mean, my players will hold me accountable to it, to it, but uh, my, my emotions carry a lot of weight. And so you have to say, ask yourself, I, I think the, the highly competitive player and the, the coach because of the leadership position, the, those emotions and the body language are more contagious than anybody else's um, teams look to players like that to define a situation, not even to change the emotional um, vibe of the team, but um, great players define situations by how they manage their emotions. And I've seen it on so many levels. I've seen it work with the, with the body language. Here's uh, Gino Ariam. If you haven't seen this, it's fantastic talking about body language. Recruiting enthusiastic kids is harder than it's ever been. Because every kid watches TV and they watch the NBA or they watch Major League Baseball or they watch the NFL, whatever sport they watch, WNBA, it doesn't matter. And what they see is people just being really cool. So they think that's how they're going to act. And they haven't, they haven't even figured out which foot to use as a pivot foot and they're going to act like they're really good players. You see it all the time. You see it every AAU tournament, you see it every high school game. So recruiting kids that are like really upbeat and loving life and love the game and have this tremendous appreciation for when their teammates do something well, that's hard. That's hard. It's really hard. So on our team, we, me, my coaching staff, we put a huge premium on body language. And if your body language is bad, you will never get in the game. Ever. I don't, I don't care how good you are. If somebody says, well, you know, you just benched Stewie for, you know, 35 minutes in the Memphis game a couple of years ago. Yeah, I did. Oh, but I was the motivator for the South Carolina game the following Monday. No, it wasn't. Stewie was acting like a 12 year old. Competitive uh, players, emotions and body language are so important. And so I think it's a challenge for, us as coaches, the, the, the typically the, the most skilled player gets away with 
not managing their emotions way too often. And we need to hold those players accountable um, because the, on the flip side, you can find all kinds of, of opportunities where when a great player handles their emotions well, they define a situation. We, we were playing Canada in a gold medal game in overtime. And <clears throat> in between the third period and overtime, we were uh, in the locker room and we had our, our captain. Um, the coaches all said a few things and, and I said, any questions, any comments? And our captain just stood up and said, we got this. And then, and then it just calmed everybody down. She also went out and scored the game winner, which helped, um, obviously. Uh, you know, just this past spring, um, we had a captain for our senior national team who in between periods um, absolutely flew off the handle in the best way possible. Because for her, managing her emotions in that way was no longer being silent. And she defined a situation and called people account, held people accountable and called people out towards their play and their behavior on the ice. And it was fantastic. So great players, when, when they manage their emotions, they become a gamer instead of a victim. And uh, we've all seen it and probably all, unfortunately, have been a gamer at times and, a, and, a, and, the, and the opposite as, as well. So the last one to close, um, the, fourth, the fourth way to have a win-win, I think, is, uh, is, is people who are devoted. And the first thing, you can't really see the pie chart, but you have to be devoted first to people, second to process, and then lastly to performance. Uh, performance will take care of itself if you focus on people and process. And the first thing, uh, I've showed this before, but I think it's, it's kind of fun uh, just to, to acknowledge that there's some, there's some barriers. Are you a frustrated hockey parent? Are you tired of your voice not being heard? Well, now there is something you can do about it. Introducing the Hockey Helper Helmet. The H3. The H3 is the first hockey helmet with a built-in headset. No more waiting for the car ride home to tell them what they could have done better. With the H3's patented on-ice intercom system, you can communicate with your player during the game. Nice shot, son. Control their movements. Go right. Tell them what to do. Drop pass. Tell them how to do it better. That's way too short to see Point out critical mistakes. That is the dumb penalty. But don't take it from us. Take it from another satisfied H3 user. We were a hand signal family. Uh, I did a lot of signaling to Jake at his hockey games from the stands, things I wanted him to do. What were some of our signs, Jake? Yeah, that's a good one. That's the straw that stirs the drink, which is really what Jake Jr. is on his team because most of the players are not very good. Um, Jake's special. I think Dylan's okay, but uh, kind of has bad hands. And so we need Jake to be a star. Um, but uh, when I, when we would talk about his games, oftentimes it was too late. We were on the car ride home. And what do I always say? When there's tears, it's too late for cheers. When there's tears, it's too late for cheers. I mean, is there anything more true than that? So I was sitting there tearing him a new one, telling him all the bad things he did in his game. Um, when I found out that there was a helmet that could actually allow me to communicate to him in games, it just blew my mind. I mean, this is like the, it's like the iPad for hockey dads, you know, and, and uh, I was concerned, I'll admit that it might look strange and he'd be teased by the other uh, players. But when I saw that it was white on white like that, really subtle, you can't even tell the difference. Um, I was into it. And, and so I uh, just wanted to, uh, to mention that parents can at times, I don't care if you're coaching at the college level, um, all the way down to the youngest, uh, parents can, can be tough. But uh, it's a reminder that great coaches, um, they're devoted to the, to the process regardless of the barriers. Uh, if you've got bad parents on your, in your group, um, then it's, it's just even more important to be devoted as a leader uh, because people become a team when individuals share a common purpose and, and respect everybody's role. Otherwise, it's just a group of people getting together on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And this really came, came true this year for us. Uh, we, we share this um, with our team. And I thought it was really a, a, a pretty a powerful tool um, because it, it challenged our team, not just to tolerate their teammates or respect them or understand them, but to really move up the value, up to the <clears throat> valuing. And uh, feel free to, to use this. It's from uh, Athlete Assessments and, and it's fantastic. It's part of the DISC profile um, 
and, and, and it's just a, a great way to, to challenge your, your, your team at any, again, any level um, to really get to that valuing of, of people. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of just skip ahead um, because I want to at least leave some time for Dave, if he has any follow-up comments or, or anything. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of skip through some of the slides. I, I think um, I'll finish with, with maybe just a, a few things with, with no more videos, but a good teammate will encourage one another when they're doing something wrong. A friend should, but might not. A good teammate does. And a good coach um, is the same way. We, we speak truth to each other, um, other coaches and, and, and other teammates, uh, regardless of if they're good friends. So um, I'll just, I'll just kind of leave it at that and, and turn it over to Dave. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I, I, I really like that last quote, but I also kind of want to talk, you know, like we're always pointing out the negatives of, you know, situations, but that good leader will have that strength lens and really strength lens, meaning they'll really look for the good things that, you know, um, this player or that player or this player is doing and really point it out because that's going to bring that value back to them and, you know, really empower them to do more of that. You know, like as a coach, we always are trying to get better. We're trying to fix this, fix that, fix that. But having that strength lens of having all of these people and how many good things they're doing, you know, uh, I, I think is super important. You know, just from talking to your colleagues and talking to you, uh, you know, you're, you're I, I think that's a big part of you promoting people. How, how, how do you think about, what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, one of the, the videos, because uh, we just, I don't think we'll have time to get to it. I, I was going to show a video of, um, um, of, of kind of that idea of celebrating what you want repeated and recognizing as a coach, as a, as a teammate, when you're able to recognize and celebrate something else, it will get repeated. And if you're looking as a coach for, for behaviors to be repeated, then celebrate the people who are doing the things that you want them to do. Um, privately account, you know, hold people accountable in the appropriate way, but man, publicly celebrate the things that you want your team to be about. And, and that's one of the things, like I said, we just didn't have time to show it, but it was a powerful video of, of, a, of a football player, Jason Witten, who um, being celebrated for his induction into, into the Dallas club hall of fame. He, he just on his retirement day, he, he shared, and he talked about how each and every one of his teammates made him better. And so it's just a reminder to your point, Dave, of, man, when we can celebrate what we want to see repeated, it will get repeated. And if we, if we don't, then, then don't be surprised if it, it kind of goes by the wayside. So you're, you're spot on. And I can't think of a better leadership quality than authentic encouragement, because when we authentically encourage people, they're going to continue to do the things that we're telling them we appreciate. Yeah, I think that's huge, especially, you know, given the society of all things on social media and everything of this person got this contract or this they signed here you know we, we want to see them doing the process and promoting that process which is i think if you have any questions just make sure we have probably just a couple minutes i know we're running a little bit long but uh we want to answer any questions uh rusty asks where does he get a copy of the athlete's assessment um disc uh profile yeah if you go if you just do a, a probably a, a, an, an internet search of uh the disc it's disc um, profile or just go to athletesassessment.com and uh and and you'll be able to find some resources um there uh, you know i i think some of those things are um are are reserved for people who who purchase the the um the profile assessment test but often the the other the pdf that i shared is is not that doesn't require any purchase so uh you could probably find it there and if not um you can certainly reach out to to, to me and I can, I can help pass it along to anybody that, that, uh, that needs it. So uh, you, you talked earlier about uh, when players are not playing and this is at the college level, how does that process go when you're, you know, the player wants to play. And I read something online about Jonathan Tays um, um, talking to um, John Scott and John Scott was not in the lineup. He was in and out of the lineup and it was talking about uh, Jonathan Tays leadership ability on you know, uh, John Scott came out and he was really mad and really angry, but Taze came over to him and kind of said quietly, Hey, we need you, you know, like you're a big part of this and just those little things can help. And I know you probably have told a lot of uh, athletes that they're not playing in the game. And that's the hardest part. Um, how does, how do you go through that and how do you help those athletes, um, stay focused? Yeah, I think, I think there's two components to it. One is the, is the organizational side of it. You know, everybody, every, 
everybody wants to be told in a perfect way. And, and sometimes as a coach, there just isn't a perfect way to share who's in the lineup or who's not. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the questions is, is, you know, as people are at different, different spots, you know, do you, you know, I think of a youth coach that has a, you know, they play three games in a tournament and only one goalie is going to play the last one, you know, how, how is that announced? How is that going? That, that can, that can be imperfect. I think the more important part, and this was the, the article that I, I saw the same quote by, by John Scott, he said that Taves came up to him privately in the dressing room afterwards and says, Hey, we need you. And I think that that personal interaction late, uh, later in the, in the conversation is by far the most important part. And as I reflect on when I've done it well, um, and when I haven't done it well, the reasons that's been, it's gone okay for me are, I have nothing to do with the words I say or the timing of it. It has everything to do with the relationship that I've worked over time to build trust and equity. It doesn't mean that they're happy with the decision. In fact, a lot of times they're not. But if I've developed a good coach player relationship, then they will trust me, even though they disagree with me and they can understand it and I can be empathetic. Um, and sometimes it's just, it stinks, you know, and that's, that's okay to admit. But, uh, but when we have a good relationship to on, on the front end, I think that makes all the difference. Yeah. And those relationships that we've, we've been talking about for the last four weeks here on those, these webinars, it's, you know, it's a common theme with all the great coaches and building that relationship from the start. And, you know, uh, even th there'll be times when you maybe pick the wrong person to be in and, you know, like those are hard things and, you know, and if you're up front and straightforward to those athletes, that's the most important part. And, you know, um, so I, I've been asking all the, all the other guests recently, if you, um, look back and you had time to talk to coach Joel Johnson, when you first started coaching, what would be some advice that you would give him? Boy, um, if I were to look back, I guess what I would say is um, don't be afraid to be wrong. Um, I think that I think there's a huge fear when when you're a younger coach that you have to get it perfect. And I think the the best thing you can do is realize that you're going to screw up. Um, you're going to send the wrong kid over the boards, and then you're going to give up a goal, or you're going to, as you just talked about, you're going to make the wrong selection in in a tryout, or you're going to do something. I think the the thing that is is most helpful is when you can admit that early and say I'm not perfect and realize that you're not and uh, I think that humility goes a long way. That's really awesome. I, I really enjoyed our our talk here and best of luck at University of Minnesota and that the, with the the women's women's teams, all the teams we coach. So um, and hope you're staying healthy. Tomorrow, we have a great uh, guest, and his name is Peter Aubrey. He is the um, Ch Chicago Black Cubs goalie development coordinator, uh, goalie development um, coach, sorry, not coordinator. And he's going to talk about, you know, the goalie's view and, you know, the scoring, the position and all that. And then on Friday, we have coach Nate Lehman. He'll be uh, chatting with us about the World Junior Championships and picking that team, youth hockey, and then also um, building that, that team at Providence College. And he's done a really good job at Providence College. So, you know, kind of this theme so far today and this week has been really big on, um, on team culture. And Coach, Coach Johnson, you did a great job at kind of outlining it. You had some, some, some great bullet points. Remember, we can, you can watch recorded episodes on USA Hockey, um, the YouTube page. So as of next week, we will be moving all our YouTube live over to youtube.com slash USA Hockey, but also you can find it on at USA Hockey Coach on Twitter, the ADM Facebook page, um, and all the recorded ones are there. So we have some really good ones that would really kind of kind of go right into this conversation with uh, a couple of the other coaches. So thank you very much, Coach. We Thanks, really, appre really appreciate it. And we will see everybody tomorrow at 3.30 with Coach Peter Aubrey.